One of the things I've been noticing about the holiday season this year in particular is the way that it can produce all sorts of time warps, emotionally, psychologically, in ways that are both wonderful and in ways that can be difficult. So for example, when my children say with excitement that they are going to be getting up before the light comes and they are going to wake us up and wake everyone in the household up as soon as they wake up, I am transported back to my own childhood when I remember waking up in the dark at 5 o'clock in the morning, my older brother would light a fire and we would watch the clock until 5.30 when we were allowed to wake up our parents. And so these things can act as touch points, traditions, rituals, familiar songs that can transport us back in time. And yet, <clears throat> This can play in another way, too. For example, I love to sit in the dark and stare at the Christmas tree, in part because it is something I used to do with my mother. She loved to do it, too. And so we would sit in the dark and look at the tree and talk quietly or not at all and simply enjoy the beauty of what we had brought and created in our house. And this is both wonderful because I remember those beautiful times with her, but it is also painful because I will no longer be able to sit with her. She doesn't share this earthly journey with me anymore. We have these moments, these touch points of stepping into the past in the holidays. And then, those are just sort of the basic ones, but there can be those unexpected portals to depths of grief that we may thought we had left far behind. Now, technically, these are possible any time of the year, but maybe there are a few extra of these grief portals during the holiday season, in part because of these rituals these familiar songs, these familiar scenes and activities that we engage in. And so just last week, I found myself stepping into an unexpected portal to this depth of grief. And it was humbling and hard, but also beautiful in that snotty tissue sort of way because it reminded me and these moments, in the end, do remind us of how deeply we are marked, our lives are marked forever by the ones whom we love. Now, I don't know where you are in your journey of love, joy, loss, or life tonight. But I trust that everyone in this room can relate somewhat to this incredible flexibility of time and emotions that accompany this season. And even if the darkness you are meditating upon tonight is not personal, perhaps you are simply meditating on the ongoing darkness of poverty, injustice, war in places you know or love, oppression, the end result is the same. We are caught in this season in which we celebrate and anticipate the growing fullness of God's light and life and coming into our world, even as we acknowledge that that fullness of God's creation and light is not yet here. And tonight, no matter where you are in your journey of faith, life, joy, grief, we are all in the same boat, at least scientifically speaking, in the Northern Hemisphere, because we are all experiencing today the winter solstice, that time when the night is the longest 
and the day is the shortest. Now, I mentioned that my mother is with us no more, and it is in fact on this day 13 years ago that she died. So why I don't have special insight or wisdom into the metaphysical realities of the winter solstice and its spiritual implications, I have thought just a little bit about this solstice and its closeness to Christmas and the ways in which the realities of both might illuminate our journey with God. So I've come to learn a few things about the solstice in the years since my mother's death. I used to only know that it meant longest or shortest day. That was it. But there's some interesting things about what the solstice means, even just scientifically speaking, that can even further illuminate, I think, our own experiences of darkness or longing for light. First of all, that word solstice comes from the Latin word solstedit, which means sun stands still. And that refers to the fact that when ancient civilizations used to watch the sun move across the horizon, north to south, and then back again each year, we could do this too if we actually took the time to watch. The sun moves where it comes up and where it sets each day of the year. But around the solstice time, there seems to be a pause. So we actually aren't pausing, the sun isn't pausing, but we perceive a pause in the sun's movement. It seems that the sun has stopped its journey, and the question almost hangs in the air. Will it start its journey back again towards more warmth, more light, the life that we need to sustain ourselves? So that's one thing about the solstice I find helpful to think about sometimes, even in my own experiences of longing for God's light, for God's movement. And then there is this second part of the solstice that is interesting. It is on the solstice that the sun is at its lowest peak in the sky. So the sun has these arcs it makes, and on the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, when the sun is at its highest point. It is as low as that peak is ever going to be, which means even at noon on the winter solstice, the sun is a bit dimmer. The light is a bit weaker, a little more indirect. And sometimes I think, again, this resonates with our lives emotionally and spiritually. We can feel like even the light we are receiving at times doesn't feel as strong as we would like it to be. We long for more warmth, more intensity. And this is part, again, of think of what it means to be on this solstice time. Now these two elements, along with the longest night, seemed really appropriate to me in the first few years after my mother died. She was a scientist and a, a science teacher, and so I thought, how perfect, how fitting, how appropriate that she would die on the longest night of the year. It seemed to mirror my grief, the depth of this tragedy in our family's life, and I thought, of course, she would die on the winter solstice. And to be totally honest, which is kind of embarrassing, this is the only side of the solstice I saw and contemplated for the first few years. And then, at some point, I do believe with God's help, it dawned on me. There is this other side to the solstice. The side that is, in fact, the predominant one in human history. And that is that the solstice is not only the hinge point that marks the darkest, longest night, it marks the beginning of the return of the light. And so it turns out it takes kind of a negative Nelly to focus almost exclusively on this dark side of the solstice, but that's where I was in my journey. And yet, through thousands of years of human history, 
the Maya, the Zuni, Celtic peoples, the Egyptians, Romans, they have seen the solstice as a time to celebrate because it marks that promised movement again of the sun, the return of more light. And so this, my friends, is where we are tonight. We do find ourselves in the longest night, and it is also the day which points to, promises, the return of more light. We need not deny the reality of one of these truths in order to embrace the other. It is a long, dark night, and more light is on the way. And the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, it is not just this season that plays games with time. We, too, play games with the calendar, don't we? We remember Jesus' birth each year anew, as if it never happened. And there's a reason for this. We are trying to recall more deeply what it means for us the rest of the year. This incarnation, this gift of Jesus Christ. But you may have noticed this Christ candle, the center candle, symbolically often in our churches, was lit the whole time. That was not an accident, not an oversight on my part, because I think it can be helpful, even as we play educational games, helpful games with the calendar in our lives of faith, to remember the bigger picture of light and darkness that we are walking in. And so I do invite you, to reflect in your own lives about what it means to celebrate Christmas on the heels of the solstice, what truths about the nature of God and the Incarnation this might imply or point to for you. But at this point, I do want to stretch our time warp just a little bit out of the Christmas season and invite us to remember the bigger story that God has already shown his unfathomable love for us creatures by descending from heaven to earth to show his light, his love, to provide a bridge between heaven and earth. He has come into the darkness of the world the darkness of poverty and empire and even death to shine his light. And the darkness did not overcome it, though the darkness, sure as hell does, did try. The light has shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not, does not, will not overcome it. Through the resurrection, the spirit of this same light of Christ is still with us in our darknesses. If you do not feel it, See it tonight in your own life. My encouragement to you is to keep looking at the horizon of your life, of your soul, with hope and trust. Let Christ, pray for Christ, to gently turn your face toward the direction from which new life will come. Because God has not abandoned us in this gift of life that God has given us. And Christmas 
reminds us that God is as close already as our breath and will save us by means that may seem small and flickering at first, but by a means that will lead to a light that is glorious, beautiful, and inextinguishable. Amen.